Good afternoon, or good morning, as it is here in the United States right now. My name is Robert Talbert. I'm a professor in the mathematics department at Grand Valley State University in the state of Michigan here in the United States. I'm really grateful for the invitation to speak to you. This is a somewhat unusual setup in that I am pre-recording this talk on video. In fact, right now, as you're watching this, I am giving another talk at another conference. So I have the distinction today of giving two different talks simultaneously on two different continents. So even though I'm not personally with you today, I hope that my talk will stir up some ideas and bring about some important conversations among you uh, about teaching and learning. And as I'll explain in a moment, I've set up some resources online that will allow us to interact and discuss what I have to say. I'm going to be speaking today on the flipped classroom. You've learned a few things about the flipped classroom, but in brief, this is a course design methodology in which direct instruction moves from the class meeting times into individual out-of-class experiences, and the resulting time in the class meeting is repurposed for active work on more difficult cognitive tasks. Typically, this looks like students encountering and making sense of basic new concepts before arriving at class time. I've been a practitioner of the flipped classroom now for about five years. I've taught several different mathematics and computer science courses during this time using the flipped classroom model. And I've written about it extensively in journal articles and at my blog, Casting Out Nines, which is published by the Chronicle of Higher Education, and which you can access at the URL you see there on the screen. I'd love to tell you that my experiences with the flipped classroom have been uniformly positive, but unfortunately, that would not be totally truthful. What I'd like to share with you today are some of the failures that I've had with the Flip Classroom, what I've learned from them, and some of the success stories that have resulted. Now, before I truly begin, I want to mention that I have set up an online discussion forum to field your questions about the talk and about the Flipped Classroom generally. I'm going to give the URL and some instructions for using this discussion board at the end of the talk today, and you'll be able to post your questions and get answers from me and from your colleagues. So for now, just make a note of any questions that you have and that don't get answered during the talk and post those to the discussion board later. So let's get started. So the first thing that I wish I had known about the flipped classroom when I started using it is that the flipped classroom has many benefits for students, but students will not always understand those benefits automatically. The first time I ran a flipped classroom was five years ago. I was teaching an introductory programming class designed for mathematics majors. I designed the course and had chosen to flip it because I felt that students will learn computer programming best when they are actually programming, rather than listening to a lecture about programming. This class met once per week for 75 minutes. The students watched videos and did practice exercises to prepare for class. Then the class time was spent working on group programming assignments where students would apply the basic knowledge of programming to real life problems. So there are a lot of advantages for running a programming class this way. Students get access to high quality video and print materials that they use to learn basic concepts before class, and then those resources remain in place forever for students to go back and use later. Students also get practice learning new concepts independently, which is a critical, and I would say the most critical, skill that a student can acquire in their entire college education. Students also wrestle with the hard part of a subject, not in isolation from me, but while I am physically present right there for them to consult. Students also get large chunks of time to work on activities that help them make sense of the subject. Now I could go on and on about the benefits of the flipped classroom. The flipped classroom made sense to me because not only are students learning the content, they are also learning broader skills that will serve them in learning any kind of content, whether they're in school or in the workforce. Now, most of the students in this computer programming class, on the other hand, unfortunately really hated the class. What they expected from the class was for me to get up and lecture and do lots of examples of programming while we were meeting. For many of them, and for many students in general, teaching and lecturing are the same thing. And so when there is no lecturing going on in class, it means that there is no teaching taking place and that they are not learning anything. The students didn't see the benefits of the flipped classroom that I've outlined here. It was really hard work for them, and their only concern was accumulating enough marks to pass the class, They're not so much with preparing themselves for using the content or building their, their self-regulated learning skills for later in life. In short, the students and I came to this class with two completely different sets of assumptions about the very purpose of a university course, and that disjointedness really resulted in a lot of significant friction. 
Now, what I learned from this experience is that university students don't have the same set of values as we instructors have as regards their education. And although the benefits of the flipped classroom are real and obvious to us, they just don't compute with many students who have a more grade conscious mindset. And so the piece of advice I would give to new flipped classroom practitioners is communicate on a regular basis to your students exactly why you have set up your class in a flipped format, demonstrate the usefulness of the skills that they are acquiring, and explain to them that working this way allows you to help them more and sets them up for success later on, not just for a good grade now. Now I do want to share one success story from this programming class. One student came to my office early in the semester with a concern about the class. She claimed that she simply could not learn this way with having to learn basic concepts before class and then work on programming in class without a lecture. When I asked her why she thought this way, she said she didn't know, but she was sure that she could not learn this way. So I asked her, what are the three most important things you've ever learned in your life? I believe her answer was speaking English, her native language, being able to walk on her own, and being able to eat on her own. That's a pretty good list. I asked her to tell me then about the lecture that she had for each of those tasks, because she's clearly skilled at speaking and walking and eating, and so since she can't learn without lecture, at least so she says, she must have had a really good lecture for each of those things. But of course, this is kind of a joke because she learned all of those things independently with help, but also on her own. I think this example made an impression on her because by the end of the class, she was one of the better programmers in the course, and she listed an improved ability to learn independently as the one thing she got most out of the course. Once she realized that she did not really need a lecture to learn new information, she was on board with what we were trying to do. And I think if we in higher education are interested in producing lifelong learners, this is a very important consideration to keep in mind. The second thing I wish I had known about the flipped classroom early on is that the biggest problem students have with the flipped classroom has nothing to do with the content of the course, but rather it's simple time and task management. I don't know what it's like for students in France, but in the U.S., students in school prior to university have highly programmed lives. They spend hours in school and then more hours outside of school on sports, school activities like music or drama, and so on. But although they're very busy, very few students seem to have ever been held responsible for managing their time or their tasks or the projects that they have going on. This is mostly handled by their parents, and it shows because when they arrive at university with a great deal of freedom, they have no idea how to manage it, and they end up getting into trouble academically because of it. I didn't realize until just last year how much the flipped classroom is predicated on students being able to manage the flow of information for a course independently. But it makes sense. We assign students things to do prior to class in order to prepare for what will take place in class. We expect students to manage their time wisely and get that pre-class work done on time. And that pre-class work is not as simple to manage as a homework set. Students have to decide how much time to give to watching video, to doing reading, to asking questions, and so forth. There's a lot of time management involved for students in a flipped classroom, and I think I was not aware of just how poorly prepared many students are for this. For example, I had a student last year in a flipped calculus class who was consistently not turning in pre-class assignments on time, if at all. When I talked to the student about it, I learned two things. First, the student was taking nearly four to five hours to complete the pre-class assignments, but they're only designed to take 45 minutes or less to complete, and the student never sought out help. He just assumed that they were really time-consuming assignments and didn't realize that he was doing a lot of things inefficiently. Second, the student had actually never used a calendar before. His entire life, his parents had remembered his appointments for him until he got to college and then just tried to keep all of his coursework and due dates in his head. So half the time he would simply forget something was due because he didn't have it written down, and the other half he would remember but not manage his time wisely. So what I learned from this experience is that part of what flipped class instruction involves is explicitly teaching students how to manage time, tasks, and information. And my advice to new flipped classroom practitioners is to make sure you devote time yourselves to discuss these issues explicitly and intentionally with your students. 
For example, there's an assumption at my university that students should spend at least two hours outside of class working on a class for every hour spent inside class. For example, my calculus class met four times a week in 50-minute sessions. Students, therefore, should plan on spending at least 100 minutes per class meeting. Let's round that up to two hours working on the class. That's two hours outside of class, four times a week, just on calculus. I found that it helped to actually break down that two hours into specific atomic tasks to complete. For example, students should devote one full hour to completing their pre-class assignment, which consists of about 15 to 20 minutes of video, plus 8 to 10 pages of reading, plus some short exercises. I would consider that actually to be a fairly short amount of time, uh, and students with weaker backgrounds should probably maybe double that amount. Then students should vote another hour each night for other tasks like working on homework, coming to office hours, and so on. Again, I don't know what it's like for students in Europe, but in the U.S., students often make it through their primary and secondary schooling without much need for outside study time. Uh, the average study time for students in high school in the U.S. is maybe three to four hours per week total. So when they get to university, they have the idea that it will be roughly the same amount of time commitment, but in fact it is definitely not. Now, I like the flipped classroom for many reasons, one of which is that it forces students to work appropriately hard on their studies outside of class and doesn't allow students to simply slide by. In many ways, it's a more academically rigorous approach to learning than a traditional classroom. But it does take a certain amount of meeting students halfway and teaching them how to manage their time. And I had to realize in that in addition to teaching content, I needed to make time explicitly to talk about how to handle the course load. But this is good, I think, because again, it's building those larger thinking and learning skills that students will need when they are done with school. In fact, the calculus student I mentioned earlier is a success story. He's an engineering major, and by the end of the semester, he had a little paper calendar that he brought with him everywhere and had learned not to keep things in his head, but to commit them to a system. And I think he will find a lot more success in school and as a professional engineer that way. So the third thing I wish I had known about the flipped classroom earlier is that the flipped classroom entails significantly more work at the beginning than a traditional classroom. Now that statement might scare many of you away from using the flipped classroom, but I want to emphasize this phrase at the beginning. In a minute I'll explain why over the long term the flipped classroom actually might yield a lighter workload, certainly a workload where you're going to focus on more important things. So where I really encountered the heavy workload of a flipped classroom first was in the fall of 2012, when I was scheduled to teach a class for our math majors designed to introduce them to the concept of proofs. It's a writing intensive class and there's a lot of mathematical content in it, and it has a reputation of being one of the more difficult classes in our program. I decided to flip the two sections I was teaching mainly because I wanted students to spend time in class writing proofs and solving problems, not listening to lectures about writing proofs and solving problems. We have a textbook for the course that lends itself well to this approach, but I decided also to add video content to the course. I made an outline for a video series that would cover the entire course and it eventually became a YouTube playlist with 107 videos, over 14 hours of video content on it. I started on this video series a month or so before school started. I did not finish it before classes started and in fact I was having to set aside an entire 8 hour day each week just to produce videos, enough to keep ahead of my students. On top of this, I had to actually teach the course, which as a writing intensive course involved grading 60 drafts of proofs each week from students, in addition to other grading tasks, and in addition to a third course that I was teaching. It was an incredible amount of work. I, had, I finished the semester completely exhausted and wondering why I had decided to do this in the first place. Now what I learned from this experience and advice that I would give to new flipped instructors is the following. First, prepare your flipped course far in advance and start working on it early. I should have been working over the entire summer prior to this course to produce those videos, but instead I had to put everything into the fall and make the video content while the course was running, and that was a big mistake. 
Secondly, take it slow. And if it makes sense for you, don't necessarily flip the entire course the first time you're teaching it. For example, you might choose to flip only a select number of class sessions, like every Friday. Or if you have a lab session, flip that. Or if you have an exam preparation session, flip that. Or just once a week when you want to have problem solving time. There is no law that says a flipped class has to be entirely flipped. It is certainly okay and maybe even preferable if you do this a little bit at a time. Third, and I can't stress this enough, work if, with a partner if you can. Now, last year in 2013, I was undertaking to flip our introductory calculus class. This was going to involve a lot of video making again, and I had absolutely no desire to cause that much work for myself again. So I found another instructor in my department who was willing to try flipping her calculus course as well. We got together and agreed to split up the video making responsibilities roughly 50-50. By collaborating and having each other to use for ideas, we were able to produce the bulk of a 91 video playlist for calculus in just 10 days time during the summer and then we were able to work at a normal pace during the semester. And that calculus course is actually going to be my success story. Now I said earlier that flipping a class takes a lot of work in the beginning, but over the long term it could actually save you time if you teach the same course over and over again. For example, I teach calculus quite a lot. This fall I'm teaching calculus again, and all the videos are completely made. I don't have to remake the videos. The only thing I have to do is design in-class activities. That is a lot less work, it's a lot more fun, and it's a much more important for student learning. The fourth and final thing that I wish I had known about the flipped classroom is something I touched on earlier, and that is that the flipped classroom's success depends on communication. In fact, I would say that any time in the past where the flipped class has not worked for me as well as it could have, it's been because of a failure of communication. Maybe I didn't explain the workflow for turning in an assignment correctly, or I didn't communicate an expectation for the amount and kinds of work students should be doing outside of class clearly, or maybe I didn't touch base with that one student who had a problem, and so on. Usually my failures with the flipped classroom have come down to either not communicating myself clearly to students, or not being as open to communication with students as I could have been. For example, in the programming class that I mentioned a little earlier, where so many students had negative reactions to the flipping of the class, I think a lot of this came from just assuming that students would understand the benefits of the flipped classroom automatically and just jump right on board. But that was a failed assumption. What I should have been doing instead was communicating why we're flipping, what this will involve, what students will get in return, and then soliciting student feedback on a regular basis on how things were going. More than that, I should have been checking in with students personally on a regular basis to see how they individually are doing. I can absolutely say that better communication would have taken that bad situation and made it manageable. But if communication is the key to a successful flipped classroom, this is actually very good news for us because communication can be very easy. These days when I do a flipped classroom, I make sure I'm doing the following things. First of all, I spend a good deal of time at the beginning of the term talking explicitly about the course setup, why it's going to help students learn, and what the benefits are. Secondly, I try to be super abundantly clear about the instructions for doing work in the flipped classroom, which includes instructions on time management. Thirdly, I make sure that I am soliciting student feedback on a regular basis in the form of anonymous surveys, clicker questions, one-minute status updates given at the end of class, and so on, just giving students a lot of chances to voice their concerns, voice their approval, and say what they need to say. And then I act upon any serious recommendation for improvement quickly to show students that their voice is being heard and that it matters. And pulling students aside in a friendly way individually if they have any serious concerns about the course. Fourthly, I try to maintain several open channels of communication for students to get help and to ask questions email, and office hours, and online discussion boards, in addition to question and answer time in class. So students never feel like they are being left completely on their own to teach themselves the subject without help. 
Finally, I make sure to celebrate students' successes. For example, if students do really well on a pre-class exercise, I will praise them for it and point out that they did this all on their own. They did not need a lecture to understand something new. Every flipped classroom I've run in which I've been intentional about the quality and quantity of communication has resulted in most students not only learning the content better than they would have in a traditional classroom, just as importantly, they feel more confident about learning than they normally would because they've seen enough concrete instances of being able to learn independently that they finally believe in their own abilities. They haven't had that belief for many of them since they were toddlers. Realistic self-efficacy is one of the most important gifts we instructors can give to our students, and the flipped class gives us lots of opportunities for this. So those are the four biggest things I've learned about the flipped classroom that I wish someone would have told me about at the beginning. Although the flipped classroom is something of an old idea, I think its time has finally come to be in the mainstream of modern higher education. It benefits our students and helps them to build lifelong learning skills and regain some contact with their basic human abilities to reason, to learn, and to grow. I thank you for listening, and I want to leave you with some instructions on the discussion board that I mentioned earlier that we can use to continue our conversation. So to help further this conversation about the flipped classroom, I've set up a discussion board for this talk and for flipped classroom topics in general at my website. Just go to proftalbert.com slash questions and you'll see a list of the questions that are currently available. Each item in the list is a question and some of these questions will have an answer thread underneath them. For example, this question has two answers to it at the moment while this one has none. If I click on the question name, it will take me to a place where I can see the question and the answers and then add my own answer or comments if I want to. If you want to see a list of all the questions currently available, click the button that says questions. To see only the questions that have not been answered yet, click unanswered. To ask your own question, click ask a question. To search the questions and answers for a specific term, type in that term to the box here and click search. If you like a question or an answer, you can vote for it or upvote it by clicking on the up arrow. This will help distinguish better answers from not as good answers. You can also include typeset mathematics in your question or answer as well by using basic LaTeX and enclose inline math with slash parenthesis and displayed math in slash square brackets. I'll be checking the discussion board actively during the week, and you can continue to use it for as long as you like. Although I am not a French speaker, if you would prefer to give your question or answer in French rather than in English, please feel free to do so, and I have a colleague here in the U.S. who has agreed to help me with translating. Again, thank you very, very much for the invitation to speak with you today. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to seeing you on the discussion board.